Lisa the Painful is a game that I wish more people knew about. For those of you who aren't familiar with it already, Lisa is a trilogy of games created by Austin Jorgensen. The first being a short one hour experience, which is free on Steam. So go check it out, dude. In fact, if you're even slightly interested in playing any of the trilogy, I would implore you to go and play them for yourself, watch a playthrough, something, because I'm gonna spoil a lot of the main bits of this game, and I would hate to rob you of experiencing such a just beautifully horrible awful game for yourself this is officially the point of no return okay ready cool now the first game focuses on the titular character lisa as she tries to escape the memory of her horribly abusive father. You'll go through an array of Yume Niki-esque rooms as you collect items and solve puzzles, eventually starting to piece together what it was that happened to her. Now throughout this short, albeit dark, experience, Lisa is repeatedly told, you'll never forget this. And these dialogues are the first time in the series that we start to receive what I think is the core tenet of Lisa. You can't just run away from trauma. Throughout the first game, the entire entire time we play, we're trying to escape from Lisa's father, Marty, but no matter where we go, where we turn, the memory of him follows us. And this is how the game ends. It, it's not with a grand escape or Lisa killing Marty. The game simply reminds us that no matter how hard we try to fight the past, it's still always gonna be there. Boom, game over, the end. It uh, it only goes downhill from here. But anyways, we aren't really told what happens to Lisa until we boot up the next game where, oh, Oh no, we haven't even clicked the start button yet, and I'm already not feeling well. Now, in The Painful, we follow Brad, Lisa's older brother, who, as you can probably imagine, was similarly abused as a kid. And while Brad hasn't tried to escape this world altogether, he has developed a rather destructive coping mechanism, a drug addiction to a substance known as joy. Now, unlike how the name suggests, joy doesn't give you a feeling of immense euphoria or a high. In the game, it's simply described as making one, quote, feel nothing. Now, sometime between the events of the first and second game, there's an apocalypse. But this isn't like your typical Fallout-flavored nuclear wasteland. No, this event erased all women from the face of the Earth. And the extent of this isn't really ever explained. All we know is that there was a big flash, and now the only people that are alive are men. But the world building that's done around this premise is really funny and well done. For instance, the currency that you use all throughout the game is porn magazines. Because think, intimacy for most of the population has been rendered completely unviable, so the only solace that most men have is porn. <laughs> I mean, I know that's silly, but it makes more sense than bottle caps does. But anyways, one day during one of his benders, Brad happens to find a baby out in the middle of the desert, and after further inspection, he finds out that the baby is a girl. Now Brad and his friends decide to keep this hidden from the outside world, because need I remind you, there are no women and in a wasteland filled with bloodthirsty men, there's no telling what they might do to get their hands on one. Brad names this child Buddy, and he raises her up in secret until one day he returns home to find her missing and all of his friends slaughtered. Now this begins the actual game. We're on a quest to find and save Buddy before anything bad can happen to her. Now throughout this journey, we find different companions who provide us with company and help us in battle, all of which have their own unique moves and play styles. Over your time in Lisa, you'll honestly start to grow closer to some of these characters, whether it be that they're dependable in battle or just outright hilarious. If you have the same crew put together for a while, you honestly feel like you're starting to build up a sense of brotherhood and camaraderie, which is great because it helps you feel not so alone throughout this experience. This dynamic has a sort of hidden dark side to it though. You see, Lisa the Painful also has a vast array of random and staged events that all but guarantee the death and loss of your party members. Sometimes they might be kidnapped in the middle of the night, and once you find them, they're nothing but a bloody pulp. Maybe you'll lose them to an involuntary game of Russian roulette, or maybe, just maybe, they get fed up with your shit and just leave the party while everyone else is sleeping. You know that guy that's been making you laugh the whole game, that you spent hours leveling up and shit? He's gone. That's Lisa. <laughs> and this barely touches on the random events that can befall a player. You can wake up poisoned 
robbed, injured. Hell, at one point in your journey, a guy just walks up and kicks you in the nuts. Why, Scott Lawson? You bastard. Point being though, the game is mean. Even meaner if you play it on the pain difficulty, where you can only utilize your save points once. There have been several times on this difficulty where I'd lose one of the characters that I really cared about, but I was forced to move on because I didn't want to lose an hour of progress loading an old save. Lisa, more so than any other game I've played, makes you feel like you're losing pieces of yourself as you progress throughout it. If you lose a party member, it's hard. If you lose your items, it's hard. The game's dynamics accurately reflect the themes that the story is presenting, and it's done flawlessly here. I think it's also worth noting the atmosphere of the game, because it manages to cobble together one of the most hilarious, yet horrifying settings that I've ever seen. One instance that sticks out in my mind is the Wally's restaurant. About midway through the game, you make your way out of this cave and you start seeing these makeshift W's sticking out of the ground. You walk a little bit further and see people on their knees praying to the heavens above. Eventually though, you'll come across an old man and his grandson. Now these two have a conversation which would lead the player to believe that the grandson is about to go through a religious ritual of some sort. Perhaps something akin to a post-apocalyptic baptism, right? But we then watch as the kid walks up to a fast food drive through speaker and he asks God for a cheeseburger meal and chicken nuggets and surely enough a bag descends from the heavens with the boys meal inside this whole scene took me for such a fucking loop the first time I saw it and it's that's the game. That's how the whole game is. <laughs> but anyways, you climb up this cliff face and you manage to find the actual restaurant that the speaker is attached to. And dude, at this point, you know, you're, you're giggling and laughing it up, right? But then you walk inside of the building and... This game has the ability to shift itself in an instant. Lisa never really allows you to get too comfortable because you truly never know what's going to happen next. And this is the case all the way down to the game's audio design. Now, full disclosure, I stole this point from Takune's video on Lisa's soundtrack. It's a really excellent video. I'm linking it somewhere here. But essentially what they said is that all throughout Lisa, there are these harsh audio transitions where most games will opt to use smooth transitions as to not startle their listener, Lisa does the exact opposite. Uh, for instance, this is the song that plays whenever you're resting. <laughs> Instead of fading the track out, the developers instead opted to cut it off harshly. Now this might not seem noteworthy out of context, but when your character wakes up to something out of the ordinary, the audio direction really helps add to the suspense. See what I mean? There are a lot of small details like this in Lisa that don't seem important by themselves, but when they're placed together, they help to form really memorable moments. And while we're on memorability, I think it's also worth mentioning the distinct visual style of the game. If you weren't already familiar with it, you wouldn't really expect a pixel graphic game like Lisa to ever get under your skin, but it does. <laughs> Going into this game blind, you would typically associate pixel graphic games with cute characters and things like that. But Lisa's character design completely destroys that notion. Not only will you fight against surreal mutants, but you'll also come across the bizarre and the downright creepy. Each character seems to have a level of uniqueness that helps them stand out from the rest, and that helps add to the game's memorability. For instance, it's been about a week since I got my footage for the game, right? And I can still remember the macho man Randy Savage guy hiding behind the cliff in the first area. <laughs> I remember that, and that means it's good character design. The actual gameplay is a nice mix of fun too. The combat borrows a page from old school turn-based RPGs, but the game also has several fun platforming bits that you wouldn't really expect from it. Furthermore, there are certain levels where you'll have to solve specific puzzles to progress. Now, none of these are really as challenging as the ones we saw in the first game, but they do help to break up the monotony of simply walking from point A to point B. But anyways, now that I've got all of the gameplay aspects out of the way. I think it's good to finish with the narrative.
As Brad progresses through the story, he is haunted by PTSD and guilt. He feels responsible for his sister's death as he wasn't there to protect her from his father, and in a way, he feels that Buddy is his second chance. He believes that he has the opportunity to do something right by protecting her from the outside world. The further that we progress, though, the more we start to realize that this isn't really about protecting Buddy. It's more about Brad trying to redeem himself and get rid of his guilt. It's sort of a similar dynamic to The Last of Us, where Joel refuses to let Ellie be used for the vaccine. Both are, in fact, the best options for humanity, but these fathers refuse to relive their previous trauma, and they'd sacrifice everything to make sure that it stays that way. I don't know, I just thought that was an interesting correlation. Eventually, though, we find out that it was Brad's friends who kidnapped Buddy. Except, it wasn't as much of a kidnapping as it was Buddy simply accompanying them. His friends took Buddy to the army so they could potentially find a way to repopulate the earth and, you know, save the world. But this realization throws Brad into a rage, and once he finds his old pals, he beats one of them nearly to death, and later, he kills another one. To put it quite simply, Brad is going fucking crazy. His withdrawals and these fights and this crazy-ass journey has slowly been turning him into a killing machine. And the further that we progress, the more that this becomes evident. So much so that when we actually manage to track Buddy down, Brad can't help himself anymore. We walk into a cave and find Buddy with Marty, Brad's father. He has somehow survived everything that's happened. Marty tells Brad that he's changed and that he's not the same vile man that he used to be. And oddly enough, Buddy seems to agree with him. The two are actually getting along with each other quite well. And as the player, we sit there stunned. Suddenly though, we're given the option to either kill Marty or spare him. But regardless of what the player chooses, Brad can't contain his rage anymore. And we begin a fight with Marty. Now, the battle with Marty is probably one of the worst feelings that you'll have throughout the entire game. Because even though Marty's an awful person, there's no forgiving that, it would seem that Brad has just completely gone off the fucking chain at this point. Eventually, Buddy will actually get up and try to intervene and stop Brad from killing Marty, but Brad will just continue to attack the both of them. This continues until Brad eventually blacks out and wakes up outside of the cave. And when we come to, we realize that Buddy is gone. We can walk back inside of the cave and find a bloody pulp where Marty had been sitting. And when we interact with it, the game simply says nothing remains. Brad eventually finds Buddy again, and this time she has seeked refuge with the army that we've been fighting against the entire game. We are vastly outnumbered, and it's obvious to us now that this is our final stand. On my way to this ambush, though, there was a peculiar sort of status effect that really caught my attention that I want to share with you guys. Brad's body is overwhelmed with a strange sensation. He realizes that he's a failure. In these moments, Brad realizes the harm that he's caused. The same trauma that his father gave him, he has now given Buddy. He's a failure not only as a father, but to himself as well. What stands before us is an impossible task. But suddenly, our companions appear. Yes, this is awesome. We've got someone to help us out in this fight, except they don't. Each member of the party confronts Brad and tells him of the foolishness of his decision. After all, he is choosing a single individual over the entirety of the human race. But Brad doesn't care. We're then forced to fight against the party members that we've grown to adore, and the fight itself is chilling. Your friends will barely hurt you, while you'll hit them with critical damage every turn. Some rounds they won't even attempt to attack at all and the status effect will simply read, they don't want to do this. But naturally, as before, Brad stops at nothing to ensure that Buddy is in his care. He kills his friends and turns his attention towards the horde of troops. The man at the head of the troops tells him to stop and that there's no need for him to die today. And Brad replies, you don't understand. 
I've been dead for the last 35 years. Today is the day I live. And God damn, dude. I mean, if that doesn't give you chills after an entire playthrough, I don't know what does. Brad proceeds to absolutely demolish the troopers. And this feels like the culmination of years of anguish and anger and pain. And for a moment, it seems like he's become unglued from mortality itself. After a few waves, the soldiers begin to cower in fear, some even remarking he's not human. When we finally exit the battle though, we can see that Brad has slowed. He's riddled with arrows and wounds, and it's become obvious that his willpower could only take him so far. Brad then asks Buddy to hug him just so he can know what the feeling is like. And the player actually gets the option on whether or not Buddy does, which if you have a fucking soul, dude, I mean, I hope you would. But the two share one last moment together before Brad asks, did I do the right thing? And that's the game. Roll credits. Thanks for watching. You've now become haunted by something that will never escape your memory. No, but in all seriousness though, the ending of this game is an absolute gut punch. Seeing Brad start to make the slow realization that he's become what he hated is devastating. He never escaped his guilt, never escaped his trauma. He simply passed it on to somebody else. And I think that this was the whole point the game was trying to get across. We all have horrible things in our past that we would love to forget about, but we'll never be able to. Memories will always live on in us, one way or another, whether they be good or bad. All we can do is put our love into the world and hope that we can make the memories just a little bit better for someone else. Lisa the Painful is a hauntingly beautiful game that I think really changed my perspective. If I ever had a required playthrough for my listeners, this game would be it. So often Often anymore, you'll see developers make a sad game for the sake of it being sad. And what's the point of that if you're not really gonna go anywhere with it? Bottom line though, Lisa is incredible. It is fucked with my emotions more than any other game has, and I'm grateful for it. My playthrough for this video was genuinely one of the best times that I've had playing a game lately, and in my opinion, I think it's the best indie RPG ever made. As always though, thank you guys so much for watching this video. You know I love you. I'm out.